Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jenny Arden. Uh, so I'm currently at Airbnb. Uh, give you a little uh, rundown, quick rundown of my history. Um, I uh, have been working for 16 years, as a 16, 17 years as a design leader, um, running very small teams and very, very large teams. I've seen the entire gamut. Um, I previously worked at Google, um, ran this mobile search team. I worked at YouTube. Worked on the self-driving car, uh, which was a wild ride, uh, literally, no pun intended. Um, and then uh, I switched over to Airbnb. Um, and that is a really fascinating company because it's completely design-led. The CEO, Brian Chesky, um, he is a designer. We went to the Rhode Island School of Design together. Um, so we have a very similar mindset. And when you are designing a company um, constantly, it has some really interesting um, effects. And I'm going to walk you through some of that. Um, so today, I'm going to really talk about how to design a design team. This is incredibly practical. Um, I want for you today to have some absolute takeaways on how to move forward um, in building a great team and some great products. So um, I'm basically gifting you my playbook. Um, this is what I do all day. And I advise CEOs all the time um, uh, with this exact same advice I'm going to give you today. Um, and you'll also find uh, a, a trend, actually it's been going on for a couple years now, in Silicon Valley, uh, a lot of VCs are hiring designers to provide the exact same information I'm about to give you today to their portfolio companies because they understand that building a great design team is actually at the core of the success of that company. So we're seeing more and more of this being core competency um, and less of sort of the extra, the, the and of the sentence. It's the, it's the actual core. So when I, when I meet with um, you know, founders in particular, especially young founders, I get the same questions over and over and over again. And it boils down to four questions, and I'm going to walk you through what my answers are. I'm going to hop around quite a bit, but hopefully you have some takeaways for today. So to make sure we're all starting with the same base understanding, I mean, this is a design conference. Hopefully I don't need to uh, explain this too much, but I'm going to walk you through my rationale for why you should hire designers. So number one. Designers will make your product something people want to use. A lot of times we mistake designers for making things beautiful um, and functional. They do those things. But ultimately, design thinking is about making something that people want to buy. Um, they are the heart. They understand the heart of your customer, and they translate it into the product. So it's the connective tissue between the two. Two. This is really important for CEOs to understand. Designers help visualize your vision. You can talk about it all day. You can explain it. You can spreadsheet it. You can show the numbers. You can show the market opportunity. But if people don't actually understand what you mean, if they're not connecting to it, it doesn't matter. And that means internally, and it means for your customers as well. So what designers do, and I love this quote from a colleague of mine. She's a VP of design at Facebook. What designers' superpower is is to translate exactly like what's in your head into something tangible. It's something visual, something that people can feel, um, and they can re uh, it sort of resonates with them. And that's a really important thing. In fact, with my team, I'm constantly telling them, OK, enough decks. I don't want any more strategy decks. I get what your strategy is. Show me what you're talking about. Stop, stop talking about it. Show it. So number three, why hire a designer? Designers see the entire experience. A lot of times in organizations, especially as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, we're put into these product teams. And you have a focus. You have a very specific focus. You, know, you have a growth team. Or um, you have a team that's launching a brand new feature or a new business unit. A great designer completely transcends all of that and knows what the actual uh, consumer experience is going to be. Yes, they're delivering on their specific area, their specific project. But in the back of their mind, they're constantly thinking about the end experience. Because customers do not think about business units. They do not think about that feature that was launched by that, that particular team. All they see is what the entire product is at the end of the day. And a great design team sees that as well. So now let's get into question two, agency or in-house. And this has come up already today. And I'll, I want to give you sort of my flavor of this and how to answer this question. So um, especially when you're a bit of a smaller company, 
you're wondering, okay, am I, do I bring on a designer? What do I do with them? Or do I hire an agency um, and maybe even pay a lot of money to do so? Let me give you the rationale of why you would go for one versus the other. So if you hire an agency, my recommendation, the number one reason why you should do that is if you need a creative jolt of energy. So prior to Google, I worked at IDEO. And one of the things that people were really paying for was that sort of amped up, we were stuck in our rut, and we just need some creative juices here to get people moving forward. That's what these innovation companies, these consulting companies are really providing. And they have a really, like a, a, an impeccable process around that in order to provide that level of energy. So it's somewhat like, um, you know, they're providing a brand new perspective, they're objective, um, they are not in the game, um, they're, they're extracted on purpose, um, and they kind of give you an outside view into a problem that maybe you're a little too close to and they can help you solve. But if you want to take it in-house, I'll tell you the number one reason why you should do this. It really affects your culture. You know, most of you know about design thinking, you understand it, it's the what of design, the designers are the who, design thinking is the what, it's what they actually do. But hiring designers will actually change how you solve problems at your company. And uh, the number one thing is that you're, you're kind of making a conscious decision that you're gonna, you're gonna change your culture. And I wanna dive into that just a little bit deeper because it's a really important aspect when you start hiring, especially more than one designer. If you get to five, 10, it changes um, the construct of your company. So Brian Chesky at Airbnb, um, he has this famous quote um, that he repeats over and over every single year. Um, I'm not gonna use his language, but he says, whatever you do, don't mess up the culture. And what he's really talking about is when the culture is strong, you can trust everyone is doing the right thing. What he means is if you have sort of a cult, like a, a, a contract, a social contract among all the people in your company of how you work, then you don't need to actually have a lot of process. You don't ha have to have a lot of rules. And when you add designers into that mix, it's basically augmenting that social contract just a little bit. Now you have to care about the customers because, and the users because you hired people who care about the users. So you're kind of shifting the entire culture in that direction, and hopefully that's for the positive, but you have to get everyone to accept it and be on board for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another way to explain this, um, I have a colleague, her name's Mia Bloom. Uh, we work together at IDEO, and she describes culture as less of creating architecture and more of tending to a garden. It's constantly changing, it's const constantly morphing. Um, and she uses this analogy, she wrote a beautiful blog post on this, um, and her analogy is that there's this uh, flock of birds, these starlings, and they, um, they've been studied by bio biologists for years, and they can't quite figure out how they move, how this formation happens. And one thing that they sort of discovered is when one bird shifts, its neighbor shifts, and then all its neighbors shift, and then suddenly it's this wave effect. All of them are moving. Company cultures are a lot like this. You have one neighbor who's kind of thinking a little bit different, and it's infectious, and suddenly it's constantly shifting and constantly changing. And the most successful companies I'm seeing today, and this is certainly like, you know, how to keep up, is you, you know it's shifting and you agree to shift. And you, you don't just like let it happen, but at, at the same time, you're conscious that it does. Um, so you're kind of constantly designing your culture and also allowing it to shift as you grow especially. So the third question to answer here, do you hire a doer or do you hire a leader? Um, I hear this question all the time, especially from new founders who are going for that first hire they're looking to fill the box. They're like, okay, I need a design team. Um, I hired my engineering team to get to a product, you know, get a product out there in the world. Um, and now I know I'm supposed to have a designer. And they may or may not understand why, but they, they understand that design is the next step. Um, so you're trying to fill that box, and chances are you're trying to have a box of one. You're trying to hire your first designer. And you're figuring out, is this person, should this person be a leader or should they be a doer? Well, first off, regardless of either one, the thing that you need to do, if you're only gonna have a designer of one, a team of one, they have to have passion and drive. And what I mean by that is they have to have passion for your product. They have to care a lot about your particular company and they have to be driven to create amazing work. Because a designer, design team of one is one of the most lonely places I can absolutely name. Uh, no one thinks like you, no one acts like you, you're constantly fighting for that user and you're hoping someone cares. 
And if you don't have passion and drive, you're going to give up and that person's going to leave. Absolutely. But if they connect to your product and they connect to your company, they'll, they'll stick around for it. They'll, they'll kind of you know, ride that wave, get through that storm, and then suddenly you're building a team and everyone is on board for having design as a, a major leadership role in the company. Another thing that's obvious, but I want to explain a little bit more about this, um, they have to have amazing collaboration skills. If you have a design team of one, that person has to know how to work with engineers, how to work with product managers. They're working with everyone but design, so you have to have co collaboration skills. So when I'm interviewing people, I'm constantly trying to figure out how do you work with people who don't think like you. Um, that's sort of the litmus test for a, de a designer of one. Um, I have a colleague, her name's Katie Dill. Um, she is now the VP of design at Lyft, which is another ride-sharing app um, competitor to Uber. And um, she just started that gig in November. And I was having coffee with her, asking her, okay, so you, you just started this new, new job. Um, you know, let's talk about collaboration. Like, how are you making this work? And she said, it's really interesting. Um, when I started the, at this company, uh, the previous design lead uh, was from, from Apple. And he created literally an ivory tower for design. He created this very white space with the door and only designers had the key. And only designers could enter this room. And it like literally separated the design team from the rest of the, t the company. And she's like, the first thing I did was I ripped out the door and the entire company cheered. Very, very practical, very, very straight up stuff, but um, that's, that's you know, an important part about collaboration. It's not just how you work with the people, but how you present your team um, to the rest of the company and just say, you know, we're here to help you. We're here to be a part um, of, the, of the product team and to build great work together. Another thing to remember is collaboration keeps us accountable to designing something for others instead of ourselves. The reason why it's so important to find collaborative skills is that if you're finding someone that's constantly saying, I think, I think, they're designing it for themselves. They're designing it because they believe they have the answer. But especially if you think about companies like Airbnb, where we're in countless countries all over the world, it's not about what you think. It's about what your customers think, because they're not like you. They're completely different. Global companies have to observe that you are nothing like your actual company your actual customers. Um, and especially in Silicon Valley, we're kind of trapped in this little bubble, this really small area where you have a high concentration of technologists who kind of drink the same coffee, go to the same gyms, they all have the same lifestyle, and yet they're designing for people that they literally have never interacted with. So it's um, really important to think that when you're collaborating well with a diverse team, you're actually supporting your customers more and the collaboration is sort of like keeping yourself in check and making sure you do that. So um, I want to also explain a little bit, um, thinking about leaders and doers, um, a lot of people translate that into junior versus senior. Um, I want to sort of explain when I think about building a design team, the real difference in levels, because titles are really confusing in the design world. You have people who are design directors with only three years experience. Um, my title is a UX manager, I've been doing it for 16. It's just like, it's completely nonsensical. So let me just talk to you about what really happens as you go up the pyramid. Um, junior designers are not necessarily worse designers than design directors. In fact, in many cases, junior designers execute far better than design directors. So what's, why, are they, why is there a separation between the two? As you go up this pyramid, the skill that is really honed and why they're promoted is storytelling. They know how to sell an idea. Um, design directors are impeccable storytellers. They know how to get everyone on board. They know how to move teams forward because they can really articulate what the problem is, what you're solving for, and get everyone else just moving. So leaders, especially design leaders, they're strategic thinkers. They are thinking across the board. In fact, with my team, I have an interesting leadership team. We have a lot of functions. I mean, Airbnb is a fairly complex business. I have a product manager, an eng lead, a, um, a research lead, a data science lead, a policy guy, like we have a, ton, a lawyer, these are all my peers. Um, 
But what's really interesting when we get together is we're all strategic thinkers and we're Venn diagrams of each other. So rather than just saying, I'm only in charge of design, we're really actually all in charge of the strategy. Um, and that's the best way to think about a leadership team. Design leaders are also your source of inspiration. Um, number one thing that any great design leader needs to do is rev up that team. Get them very excited about what they're building. That's, that's going to affect your retention. It's going to affect the output, um, the speed in which people work. Everything stems from inspiration. If you think about all the people that you have, and I, I have a lens of tech, so I know it's not exactly translating to every single business, but in my industry, um, if the the CTO is in charge of building it, the feasibility. The PM is there, the product manager is there to make sure it gets launched. The designer better make sure that everyone is very excited about this project because that's their job, that's what they're there to do. Storytelling, we already talked about that as being a primary function, and then systems thinking. So again, thinking about how everything is gonna work together. These are the key attributes if you're interviewing for a leader. These are the th four things that you should absolutely be interviewing for um, and making sure that they, they have. But a doer, um, again, one is not necessarily better than the other. It depends on what you need in your company. A doer loves creative exploration. If you put them in a little tiny box, they're gonna suffocate. They need time to explore. But they can't just be in designer la la land forever, right? So the best way for them to not be in that space is to find someone that works fast. So if you can find someone that can you know, bang out like 30 ideas in two days, you found someone good, you found an excellent doer. And that's really sort of the crux of um, the success of sort of an individual contributor team is finding those really prolific doers that just can't wait to keep exploring um, and they can't wait to flex their creativity skills. Obviously, their craft and execution is amazing. Um, again, leaders might not have that, but doers absolutely have that. And they have a beautiful portfolio. And lastly, a learner mindset. Doers are constantly changing their skill set and, and, and moving on and trying new things. They're constantly trying to hone their craft. Um, and I also want to make it really clear that I and my team have doers that are at the top of our sort of level system and uh, leaders, managers who are on that same level system. So, you know, if you think about your org structure, you have like, you know, junior designers, we call them like L1s, all the way up to our like executives. We have doers who are all the way up to the executive level for a very good reason. Um, it's, it's all about making sure execution is paired with leadership all the way up to the top. So another really important thing about doers, um, if you didn't know this already, is they're not all the same. Um, we constantly talk about headcount as just like butts and seats. It's not true. It's completely not true. And it's the same for most functions. Um, there's a huge gamut of what kind of designer you may want to hire, and it really flexes according to what kind of company you have. So you may, if you're in tech, you're definitely going to hire what we call product designers. Um, you're going to have some uh, digital designers, like people who kind of like front-end engineers. Whereas if you have a physical product that you're selling, like socks, you're going to have a lot more brand um, and identity design. So just really be aware that um, in your job rec, it's really like there, there's a huge gamut here. And many people actually do flex and cross between these disciplines. But um, it's, it's hard because it's so complex and there's so many different kinds. So make sure you're getting sort of the right tool for the job um, and that you really understand what you're trying to solve for by hiring that doer. So um, let's say, though, you're really sort of not sure. Leader or doer? Leader or doer? What do I do? The first question I would ask you is, do you expect rapid growth? Um, this is really important. I see over and over and over again these small startup companies, there's like 10 people, they hire this amazing doer, but they're growing so fast that by the end of the year, they've outgrown the doer. And what I mean by that is I, I meet with you know, this, this designer and they're like, you know, I came to make things, I'm a creator, and now they're expecting me to manage a team because uh, they hired four or five people and I don't like management and I, I lost my, my trade, I, I don't, I'm not designing anything. It's because you hire the wrong person into that role. Um, yes, you need people that are going like, to pump out the work, but if you're going to grow really, really, really fast, you should probably hire a leader that knows how to build a team. 
Um, so anticipate, know exactly where this whole business is gonna go and hire the, the person that you need six months and 12 months from now. And then sort of lastly, and sort of leader versus doer, um, another thing to really consider is looking at your team that you have in place right now. If you're a smaller company and everyone you've hired was like an ex-founder, they have like multiple degrees, they're clearly leaders, and you throw in a junior designer into that mix, chances are they're gonna be steamrolled over and they're not gonna have any voice whatsoever. So really think about dynamics within the team and the group. Um, if you have a bunch of leaders, maybe you should hire a leader as well. Just consider that. Um, again, it's, it's, you know, every single business situation is different, but it's something to definitely consider. Now, when you do decide to hire a leader, some of the things um, I look for that uh, I, I think is really, really important and making sure that you hire someone that other designers are going to admire. Um, now, you, you don't need a famous graphic designer um, to achieve that, but you do need someone that holds the bar really, really high. Um, someone that is constantly gonna push people for better pixels and better work. Um, we often look for people who have tons and tons of experience, um, but we never, like, it's very rare that I hear in interviews or when people are talking about who they're hiring, um, you know, how, when, when are they gonna say no to shipping? That's a tough call. That's a really, really tough skill to have. When are you gonna say it's not good enough? Um, we, we haven't actually met the mark. And when are they gonna let go and say, you know what, we just need to ship? These are the nuances of being a design leader that's really important to look for. So if you're gonna hire a leader, here are the thing, three things that you need to do to set them up for success. Number one, report to the CEO. This is a really interesting trend that's happening in Silicon Valley right now. Um, how, of, of the room, if you're a CEO, do you have a designer reporting to you? Please raise your hand. There's one, two, there's a few. If you, if you ask this question now, in Silicon Valley, a lot of hands are going up. And a lot of design leaders are actually forcing it. They're saying, I would love to join your company, but only if I report to you. And there's a good reason for this. If you really think about a product team as a coming of minds, where, oops, yeah, where you're all putting each other in balance, um, meaning the product manager is there to launch great work as quickly as possible, the technologist is there to build, build something that's not buggy, that's stable, um, feasible, it works well. You know, in our, in our business, we have policy people to make sure it's legal. Um, we have all sorts of lenses looking at the product. If you don't have an equal voice at the design level that's advocating for the user, it creates an imbalance. Um, and that's a really important thing that people are starting to learn, that it's all about influence. So when you have someone directly reporting to the CEO, it means that designer has equal influence as the other functions. It also tells the rest of the company that you value the creative perspective. So when you have a designer reporting to the CEO, suddenly people listen, and suddenly, again, back to that culture switch, the birds start shifting, and other people start listening. But if they're reporting to product, often it takes a longer time for the flock to move. So that's sort of the mentality and the things that have been happening. I've seen this trend over the last six months in particular. And lastly here, please integrate them into the team. Do not create an ivory tower. Do not lock them behind a door. Um, this is really, really vital for the success of your team. It's not just for the design team, it's for your entire product. Um, they need to be integrated, sitting next to everyone else in the company. All right, so last one. Uh, how do I find a designer? Oh man, this is tough um, because just in my own recruiting team, I need, a, I need a new lead. They told me it's gonna take three to six months to find someone, which is insane. I mean, that's a really, in tech, that's an eternity um, to, to get someone in that role. So, I have some advice on how to handle this. Number one, we have to look at other pools. And what I, what I kind of tell my team and the recruiters all the time is like, find the misfits. I see the same resumes over and over and over again. I, I know who the people are. It's a small world, the design world in particular. It's a small cohort. We need to find the people that we're not typically looking for. And one of the things to keep in mind, um, this is kind of near and dear to my heart these days, is that 29% of creative directors right now are women. 
Just some context, that's, that's all creative directors. In tech, it's 11%. The top of the funnel started in creative directors, and well, let's start with tech, was 35%. So already, it's like shot way down to, to you know, almost single digits. We're getting really, really low for, for female leadership in particular. And what we're discovering is just you know, women are leaving at rapid rates. It's, it's a total leaky bucket. Um, just last week, I had a direct report. Um, she was one of my top performers. She made the decision to leave work and to stay at home with her, her one-year-old. Totally, she did the right thing. She did exactly what she should have done for herself. I guarantee you, in three years, I'm calling her um, because she's amazing and I know she's going to want a job. But these mothers are really, really afraid that they're going to be completely um, ob obsolete, that no one is going to hire them when they come back. There's no chance I'm not hiring her. I know how, what good quality she is and I know what kind of work that she can produce, but she has that fear. So we need to start thinking about the long game. You know, if you have someone that exits, call them up. In a couple years, they're going to want a, a job and you know what they're capable of. This is one of the things I think tech in particular can solve. Um, if they stop looking at the short term, who's available right now all the time, and start keeping track of the long term and keeping track of long term careers. Another thing to remember is that 82% of creatives say a diverse team produces the best work. So if you are really thinking about a global company, you're thinking about um, designing things for massive amounts of people with so many different cultures, everyone agrees a diverse team is necessary, but we continue again to regurgitate the same resumes and the same people. I, you know, especially at Google, I love that company to death, but I also worked with people at that company that also worked at Apple and Facebook and all the big guys. They're all kind of hopping around. We need to pull people in from different pools. Um, one of the sort of recruiting exercises that Airbnb had done that I loved was we went to um, second, what we call second tier cities. They're not really second tier, they're just not our primary markets like New York and uh, San Francisco. So um, we actually went to Philadelphia and we did a, an, an artist speaking series on graffiti. Had nothing to do with technology whatsoever. But it was super inspiring and I met a lot of kind of budding artists who were doing user experience kind of on the fly, completely untrained, and there's some raw talent in there. And more importantly, there's some super fresh ideas going on in those sort of markets. So you kind of have to be a little bit more creative and look at areas where people aren't constantly recruiting and tapping into. And to follow up with that point, 90% of creatives have a degree in a very wide range of disciplines, meaning um, the chances that someone has a degree from the Rhode Island School of Design and you're gonna find them and you're gonna hire them is really, really, really small. People major in like architecture and communications and English and all sorts of degrees um, and then become designers along the path. Um, if you just go to the top schools and only recruit from that pool, you are missing out from the non-traditional uh, a pool of individuals who are highly, highly talented. Um, on my team alone, I have four people who never um, went to college. Um, they have high school diplomas, but they never went to college and they are severely talented. So you kind of have to like think outside the box, know that design is a discipline of taste and thoughtfulness and not necessarily academic rigor in the same way that we think about it. Um, data science, it would be a completely different situation. Uh, at Airbnb, we have PhDs of data science all over the place. They're the smartest individuals I've ever met. They're absolutely qualified to do that job. Design is a different world. It's all about experiences and knowing the customer. It's not as analytical. It's a little bit more subjective. Um, and certainly, the empathy, empathy skills is, is primary there. So big takeaways for today, some things that um, I want to give you like actionable um, steps here that might be new for you in case you're struggling with this. So please stop searching by titles. It's not going to help you. If you only look for head of design and VP of design for your company, you're missing out on a diverse pool. You're, getting, you're basically inundating the same people who get a million LinkedIn requests um, and they're not going to respond to you. So if you only search by title for these individuals, you're not gonna get anywhere. You have to be more creative than that. This is something that I've observed, and I wanna explain this. Look for loyalty, but no movement. It is very, very rare for a good designer, sorry, it's very, very rare for a bad designer 
to stick to one company, meaning if they're not effective, they get shuffled around quite a bit or they just get fired. People who are good stay and people want them to stay. And actually, I've seen engineers beg designers, please don't leave, I love working with you. And they're the ones that are like advocating for them the most. What I see is in the ranks, um, these, these really effective collaborative designers are sticking around, but they're not always getting promoted for many different reasons. Maybe they're slightly introverted. Maybe they have a different leadership style than the company is supporting. Um, there's always something that's like slightly like off culturally between that designer and the company, but the team loves them because they have those core skills they already listed from before. Look for those people who've been there maybe three, four years. And they're probably itching for a leadership opportunity, but they haven't been given it. I've recruited this way many, many times. I highly recommend just trying it, just talking to a few people. And lastly, ask the doers. Um, the people who are doing the work are at an elevation level where they understand who the real, real leaders are. You have people who are given the title, but the real leaders are, it, that's a skill, not a title. So the real leaders are actually you know, flexing that muscle and the doers see it and they know it. And so if you, you know, I do a lot of skip level in, um, one on ones. So rather than just talk to my direct reports, I talk to the, the level below that to see kind of what's going on in the trenches. And the doers tell me who's actually excelling and who's actually kind of moving things forward. And at the end of the day, sort of the, 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 the main takeaway here is I really want you to look for those dark horses. What I mean by dark horses, these are the people who haven't quite been given the chance. They have impeccable ability. If you know, performance equals potential minus um, interference, these are the people that have so much interference that their, their performance has not truly been met. Their potential is there, but the performance hasn't cr uh, truly uh, reached the level that they're capable of. Dark horses are hungry. They want the next opportunity. And if you want a really, really great design team, you have to look for those individuals, not the typical. So now that you've hired that design, designer, design team of one, um, you've filled that box, you've figured out if you're gonna have a leader or a doer, you're gonna expand, then you probably will think about hiring a researcher next. Um, that's usually what I recommend is the next discipline. A lot of people say, let's just hire more designers because we have a huge backlog. The thing is, without a researcher kind of stepping in very, very early on, you miss a lot of the customer insights and a lot of the, the process that's needed in order for that designer to do great work. And then you start really kind of stretching out, creating a well-rounded well team. You add content strategists, visual designers. At Airbnb right now, we have 17 different roles under the design team, and they all do something different. So you kind of, you know, you start to understand that this is a really complex team. It's not just a design team. It's a, it's a bunch of flavors all put together. And eventually you have a design org that looks like this. This is Airbnbs. We have a ton of designers building really amazing products, um, all, you know, pushing for diversity, pushing for really forward thinking um, uh, product design. And uh, we're constantly growing. We went from 300 people to over 200 in just the time I've been there. Um, we, we're probably going to add another 100. But you know, one of my big mandates here is to make sure if we're going to add 100, make sure that those people understand the global customer and not just the customer in Silicon Valley. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jenny. So a strong theme is about um, design being linked to kind of user experience. So I've worked with uh, designers before, if I kind of reflect back, who would have been very, who are actually very good kind of technically at their skill, mm -hmm. but sometimes people are more interested in what they think about the product or the jacket or the experience than what customers are. Yeah. Is that a function of the team? the organization or of the designer? Yeah, so um, it can be a little bit of both. So if you kind of, when I was getting to at the end there that you have to have a, re have a researcher in there, mm. that person helps get the designer from thinking about I into we. You want to get your team as quickly out of the I statements into the we. And so if you have someone whose job is to listen to the user, having those two leaders sit side by side 
alleviates that problem. And I definitely do see people say, well, you know, I have great intuition. I think I know the answer. I have great experience. I've been working in this space for a long, long time. If you don't have a researcher to, to sort of gut check that all the time, and even better, if you have a data insights team that can also give you some gut check, um, you will get into those, those traps. So at a company like Airbnb, if research and customer insights sit within design, mm -hmm. what does marketing do? And what's the kind of relationship between the two? Yeah, so really, um, this is a fascinating question. Um, a lot of uh, creative directors, um, those who are reporting to the CEO, those leaders, would say there's no difference anymore. The marketing is product, product is marketing. And so those leaders actually have the, the marketing team, the product marketing team, and the product team all reporting to them because they see such a connection between the two. Um, you know, a lot of time, especially with these apps, the app is marketing. It is the face of the company. It's the only face of the company that they have. Um, and so there's, there's, it's so, so blurry that you can't really make that distinction anymore. And when you're thinking about strategy, when you're thinking about, can you talk a little bit about the distinction between company strategy and design strategy and what sort of framework you find useful versus too short or too far to be helpful? Yeah, so it's kind of unfair with Airbnb because they're the same thing. Um, you know, Brian Chesky thinks like a designer. So the company strategy is our design strategy. In fact, it's really funny. We have these design reviews. They're so not design reviews. They're completely strategy reviews and business reviews. But again, designers, their superpower is articulating the vision through, through like the screens, the pixels, um, something that's super, super visual. We, at, at least at Airbnb, we need those to express what the business is going to do. So there's really no distinction between the two. Um, other companies I've worked at, um, certainly there was a difference. Um, and it had a much more process heavy way of thinking about design. There was like a moment in time when design was supposed to enter um, and then exit the scene once they're done with their work. Um, I do think that that's changing as we're getting more design leaders who understand business. And the real success for design leaders in this, in this space is that, you know, we have to, we have to like talk that talk. Um, when I'm talking to Brian or I'm talking about to any one of our business leaders, I have to know what the growth numbers are. I have to know all of the supply. I have to know all of demand. I have to know what our actual markets are doing in order for me to even be a part of that conversation. So if you're looking for a design leader, you also have to make sure that person can sort of play ball with everyone else on the team. Otherwise, what's the point? You're not actually having a conversation. You're still doing sort of like over the fence, chucking work over. So it sounds like design has changed a lot. It's kind of becoming more morphic, yet more specialized, right? There are 16 different disciplines, I think. Yeah. Pulling up. Yeah, so again, that pyramid, um, to, when you get to the top, you get leaders that are closer to the other functional leaders. Again, they're a Venn diagram of each other. But then as you get to the bottom of the pyramid, you have that slew of role, um, like you know, 17 different roles that you can hire for. So that's why the pyramid is even like that shape, because you have so many people needing to fill different sort of disciplines in different buckets. In your view, can you have a great design leader who hasn't been a designer? Ooh, that's a really good question. Huh, well... Jenny's a great planner, and she goes, can you please tell me what questions you're going to ask like, me before the thing? I go, no. Nah. I, like <laughs> I like being prepared. Um, yes, but with with caveats. Um, so you can definitely have someone that's really great at, like for example, um, at Airbnb, our creative director, Alex Schleifer, he is an engineer by trade, but he understands design really, really well, and more importantly, he inspires the team. Um, and that's the real kind of telltale of, of a great design leader. Um, and I've, I have definitely seen like researchers who are great design leaders. They're not opening up Photoshop and Sketch all day, but they know what the team needs in order to move forward. So you can have people who are you know, not designers, but they, they have to know how to lead and inspire a design team. And thinking about user experience and e-commerce, and one of the key things is conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's uh, arguably two ways of approaching that. There are established consumer heuristics about how people are using online platforms. Yet, if you want cut through, you can't do with something fresh mm -hmm. and different. What's your view on, do you swim with the fish 
or do you kind of try and create different heuristics yep. that are distinct from kind of established patterns? Because 10 years ago, there were, there were no established patterns, right? Yeah. Um, so I talk about this with my teams all the time. You have to do both. Um, so a really clear example of this is usually your typical growth team. Um, they are, um, you know, growth team means like top of funnel conversion. They're doing ads and marketing campaigns, Facebook ads, or just getting more users. They are constantly banging out work on a weekly basis, like short term, short term, short, short term. But in order for them to actually make any major movements, they need to have some long term bets simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So when I'm planning with my, my leads, I always say we need to have at least three one-year bets in this like sh giant list of short-term bets. And if you don't, the team is constantly going like this. All these short-term bets are sort of like pulling them this way and then pulling them that way. There's no anchor to where they're actually headed. And so it helps the entire team understand where it's all going. And do you still do kind of multiple prototypes against solving for one area and test or... Mm -hmm. is, or or what sort of process? How do you know when, when uh, you've come up with the right product? Yeah. Or how do you know when it's time to ship? Uh, yeah. You say? Um, so in tech, um, most designers now prototype um, with engineers. In fact, sometimes they even like deliver the final code to engineers to use. Um, I have some people who are that good at coding um, who are on the design team. Um, prototyping is essential um, for really um, fine-tuning what the customer needs. So, you know, without prototyping, when you, t when you make that first design, generally you get 70% of the way there. To be a great, pro I mean, that's launchable, sort of. Um, hopefully it's not super buggy. Um, it's enough for you to, it's, it's enough for you to sort of get, get a taste. Uh, is this working? But a great product that's gonna stay and get your customers to stay gets to that 98, 99% accuracy. And that's what prototyping is for. It's getting from 70 to like 99% accurate. And the more you do it, the more revs you put in there, the more you inch closer and closer and closer. And sometimes it can be infuriating. I mean, I worked on a design with my team. Uh, there was a, a portion of the app that was a, it's a calendar view for, for a host. So hosts are the people who list their properties on Airbnb. And it's actually really complex. The calendar is how they manage their entire company. Um, thinking of hosts as like small entrepreneurs and small business owners, we think of them as having companies. Um, we had to go through 40 or 50 prototypes to get that right. Um, and each one we put it in front of users and constantly talked to our users. And so in that particular project, we actually, the internal narrative is that we designed it with our customers, not for our customers. And prototyping helped us do that. And just a final question about uh, consumer behavior across different cultures. Mm -hmm. So you're in Silicon Valley in that ecosystem, yet some of your users live in Tokyo. Some of your businesses, your mm -hmm. homes live mm -hmm. are in Tokyo uh, or in, you know, Innsbruck. Um, does the same stuff work? Do you adapt for the Japanese view of Hosting, or how, how do you become? Do you glocalize? Yeah, yeah. So the answer is no. It does not always work. In fact, most of the time it doesn't. Um, our Chinese app is completely different. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had to use it. It's great. We have an entire design team in China designing a brand new app. It has its own code base, and it's completely different than the American version because that's a very different company. We couldn't tweak it enough to fit the need of that, that audience. We had to build something brand new for them. And, and with that, we actually launched a brand new um, uh, logo and a whole, there was a whole brand around it because we recognized that this is a totally different ball game. And in tech, no one has done China right. So many people enter and then they have to get out of there because they didn't really actually look at how different it is to work in China. And so that's a really great example where we're just like, okay, let's start from scratch for this audience because this is not gonna work. Jenny, thank you so much. Thank you. Cool.